I must disagree with my esteemed <laughs> colleague here. Okay. Except First of all, part. let me say that <laughs> science is the engine of prosperity. From steam power to electricity to the laser to the transistor <coughs> to the computer. That's not true. We're That's talking about. Hey, wait, hey, can I have my? Can I have my <laughs> sure. You had your say. Let yes. me have my say. Yes. However, the information revolution has a weakness, and the weakness is precisely the educational system. The United States has the worst educational system known to science. Our graduates compete regularly at the level of third world countries. So how come the scientific establishment of the United States doesn't collapse? If we're producing uh, a generation of dummies, if the stupid index of America keeps rising every year, just watch network television and reality shows, right? How come the scientific establishment of the United States doesn't collapse? Let me tell you something. Some of you may not know this. America has a secret weapon. That secret weapon is the H-1B. Without the H-1B, the scientific establishment of this country would collapse. Forget about Google. Forget about Silicon Valley. There would be no Silicon Valley without, without the H-1B. And you know what the H-1B is? It's the genius visa, okay? You realize that in the United States, 50% of all PhD candidates are foreign-born. At my system, one of the biggest in the United States, 100% of the PhD candidates are foreign-born. The United States is a magnet sucking up all the brains of the world, but now the brains are going back. Right. They're going back to China. They're going back to India. And people are saying, oh my God, there's a Silicon Valley in India now. Oh my God, there's a Silicon Valley in China. Duh. Where did it come from? It came from the United States. So don't tell me that science isn't the engine of prosperity. You remove the H-1B visa and you collapse the economy. In Wall Street Journal, editorialized against a congressman who wanted to ban the H-1B, saying go take jobs away from the American people. The Wall Street Journal said, look, there are no Americans who can take these jobs. These are at the highest level of high technology. They don't take away jobs from Americans. They create entire industries. We, and so that's why we have an Achilles heel, and that's the educational system. The, and again, the, the sociology irony, majors the, are not necessarily the, going to be the ones determining the future of Silicon Valley. The, the, but physicists, okay. the engineers, the, the, we need more of them, not less. The irony is, the irony is, <laughs> the irony is, I, I agree with the immigration issues, what you're saying. Uh, and I'm at a school, of course, and Peter's a graduate of a school where, where indeed, your school wouldn't exist without the H-1B. Of course, of course. But, I, but I'm not going to get back to the future I'm not, of business. But hold on a second. I'm not. No, 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 no. I'm not arguing against an, H, an H-1B. I, I completely agree with this issue. And, and the point on the future of business that he's making, which is very, very important, is the nature of human capital. What is misunderstood here is, again, how poorly run schools are. MIT is a notable exception in this regard. His school, his school, his school is not. Because what happens is they, they run in these introductory science and engineering classes at Illinois and Wisconsin and Michigan. They run freshman and sophomore years as flunk out operations. They, 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 do it to, they, they run it as a boot camp. And then people are surprised that people don't take science, that they don't take the STEM courses. The point that I'm trying to make, which, is, which I think is, is an important one in this regard, is that the way educational systems are set up right now is that we have distorted incentives that under undermine the ability for America to have a homegrown uh, science and technology. We will still have wars. People have self-interest. They have strategic interests, domestic resource interests, and so what have you. However, the question is, whose interests are we talking about? The interests of the king or queen? They don't care about public opinion. They don't take polls. They just go and wage wars. Now, with a democracy, it's much more difficult. You have this raging debate in the newspapers. You see mothers coming on TV crying about their child that died in the last war. To go to war for a democracy takes a lot of work. But that all is a good thing. Because once a democracy decides to go to war, it's full blast. But you have the will of the people behind it. Now, uh, let me ask you one more question about uh, democracy and technology. And I think the two have actually something in common in the sense that they create this artificial sense of agency. And take my iPad, for example. Like, I, it gives me the impression of control. I, I think I can use whatever I want with it. But the problem is, of course, that you know, I cannot change the operating system. I can only download the applications that have already been created for me. And I think democracy is a bit similar in that regard, that people believe that they have all the controls at their disposal, but some of those controls seem to be artificial. So uh, I guess what I'm saying is that this, uh, both democracy and technology can numb your sense of agency. Let me ask you a question. Name a better system that has withstood the, 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 the long period of time that has given people prosperity, given people peace. Give me the name of another system Mr. that Chicago, is better. I'm not arguing against democracy. I'm arguing against the appearance of democracy, which I think exists in There's many no of the Western countries. There's no such thing as a perfect democracy. The Greeks did not have a perfect democracy. They had slaves, for God's sake, when democracy was first created. Well, I think it's a, it's a very American argument, but uh, for many I people... I think it's not American. It is the argument. 
Well, I, I don't want to get into an argument with you, but I, I think it is problematic for many people. But that's what democracy is all about. Democracy is about sharpening two points of view and let the best argument win, rather than saying, I'm the king, off with your head. But okay, let me sharpen my point. Uh, George W. Bush was a democratically elected president. Obviously, as you said, he had some consultations about that war, but that war was launched under a false pretext. The democratic procedure that exists there in the United States, consultations with the Congress, because the Congress wasn't consulted back then, so the, the democratic procedure wasn't really explored. I think what people you're didn't saying have to actually First deliver of all, the that very judgment. fact that you can actually say these things is a testament to the fact that the world has come a long ways from the days of the czars and the kings and the queens. You'd be put in prison for saying a fraction of the things that you just said. But I wonder why, why is it that freedom of speech is considered to be the domain of a Western democracies? Freedom of, of speech, freedom of science, freedom of exploration existed in a non-democratic world not as well. Exist. Name me a country. Name me a country throughout history, human history, that had freedom of speech, freedom of science, freedom of religion. Name me that country. To a limited extent, you can't. a lot of them. You can't China, because there is Russia. none. Well, to a freedom, oh, yeah. freedom of I science. I think so. If you, if you disobey the emperor, off with your head. Again, challenging the democratic system could be also very detrimental. And I, I would like to get your opinion on the, this IT vigilantism that we've seen over the past a uh, few years, uh, whistleblowers in the United States who blow the whistle on the American system because they believe that Which it's Which I think is a good thing. I mean, the very fact that they can go out there rather than being assassinated is a testament to democracy. Isn't that also a case that democracies want to impose that point of view on everybody else because... Uh, what that, point that of same, view does a democracy want to impose on everybody else? Democratic way of governance. And we've seen a lot of uh, very... Well, democracy wants to promote that. democracy. But democracy does not promote a religion. And while a religious group, a fundamentalist group, they want to impose their historical point of view on everybody else. And if you don't agree with it, you get your opinion on but uh, Mr. Kaku, it's the same with democracies, and uh, American democracy, I think, is a prime example here, because if you disagree with the American way of living a life, you know, you, you, you face a very real danger of a war being pushed onto your country. Let so, me ask you a question, right? In Afghanistan, do they harbor terrorists who wanted to do damage to the United States? I don't know do that. Do nations... And who, no, okay, let me ask you a question now. On tape, let me ask you a question. Absolutely. Who is behind 9-11? Are you a conspiracy theorist? Not Are really. you these people that think that maybe George W. Bush toppled his own building? What do you think is behind 9-11? Let me ask you that question. Who was behind 9-11? I think Let me ask you a question. I heard Who was question. behind 9-11? Mr. Kako, uh, I think... Ask, answer me a simple question. Who well, is behind 9-11? I give you the courtesy of being on your show. You should give me the courtesy of answering one simple question. Well, okay, Who I is think behind well, I, 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 I do uh, tend to believe in this conventional narrative of al-Qaeda and Osama bin Laden being behind uh, that tragic and horrendous attack. But the question is whether the death of those people justified hundreds of thousands of people who were killed afterwards. And I don't think the goals that were set out before that war were actually achieved during that war. And that's the biggest problem. And you've been very critical of radical groups uh, trying to impose that sort of uh, that point of view. And I totally agree with you. But I think the way and the means that democracies employ are not much better. I disagree. If you equate barbarism and religious fundamentalism with the principles of democracy, I think we've lost, if we accept your point of view, that there's some kind of moral equivalence between forces of darkness and ignorance and torture and persecution and the forces of democracy. I think we've lost. As far as I'm concerned, there are a lot of people who, uh, in this part of the world, and many others, who truly believe in democratic ideals. And they're trying actually to, you know, uh, you know our countries are in transition. But uh, the problem that I see in many of the established Western democracies is that people have uh, grown used to taking those democratic uh, ideals and democratic freedoms for granted. And they no longer challenge their own authorities and no longer uh, subject their authorities to you know, to the, all those tests that are, have actually been uh, described in the writings of the uh, American founding fathers. Everything you've said can be summarized in one sentence. You feel that American democracy is not perfect. I agree. I'm not going to defend imperfect decisions by an imperfect democracy for positions I don't agree with. I just believe in the principle, the fact that these things were hashed out in the press. I know because I was part of the debate. I know how vigorous the debate was in Congress, in churches. People were debating whether or not we should go to war in the Middle East. And I think that's a testament to the, the, the health of the, of the democratic process. And I think I have history on my side. But I'm not asking you about uh, electing a leader once every four years. It's not about that. Democracy is not just about going to the polls. I'm asking you... That's the bottom line. About, no, well, I don't think it it's a bottom line. It comes down to the vote. When everything is said and done, it comes down but to why, a vote. But why does it have to be once every four years? Because the Internet allows us, again, to have a vote on every single consequential issue. For example, the American president is considering arming the Syrian rebels. Why not to ask the American people whether they support that decision? The Internet gives us that, After that right. everything is said and done, you have to have rules, rules for the vote, representation of how many nations, how many people can vote for different kinds of candidates, and how long will they serve. If a president only serves for six months, you get chaos. If someone serves for 20 years, you get a dictatorship. You have to have a happy medium. The person should be given the benefit of the doubt that during that period of time, they can carry out policies that people believe in. That's why we don't have government by the internet. Government by the internet would be chaos, because every day a new poll is taken, and of course people are fickle. 
that's a very interesting idea, but let's elaborate just to some extent. People appear on political ads, they try to spread their ideas, and if you look there's at the difference. data... And there's a difference. The internet is instantaneous. There's a barrage of ideas coming at you all the time. A, a government by the internet would change every second. You don't like somebody, you vote them out. It would be madness, sheer madness to have, have a government by the internet. But I wonder why do we have to have those two extremes, you know, electing a president once every four or five years, uh, and, uh, well, maybe an alternative. Well, for example, an alternative would be, again, when you have major decisions about the future of your country or the future of somebody else's country, actually, for that matter, ask the people. It doesn't have to be every single step uh, that will be uh, you know, decided by the Internet voters, but you can have those, uh, those polls once in a while when the decision is consequential. I disagree, because sometimes the popular decision is the incorrect one. Sometimes you have to have a leader that's not short-sighted, just sees the polls day by day, but has the long-term point of view. We remember our leaders who were visionary precisely because they ignored the day-to-day, hour-by-hour feelings of the people around them. Now, uh... Many scientists look at the SETI program and they say, see, we've scanned the heavens and we see no evidence of any intelligent life in outer space. Well, I don't think so. I don't think that perhaps in the next century we'll find any usable signal from outer space. First of all, we've only scanned perhaps 100 light years from the planet Earth in some detail. Our galaxy is 100,000 light years across, and galaxies are tens of millions of light years distant. So we've only scanned a small neighborhood of our galaxy. Second of all, we've only looked at frequencies near the frequency of hydrogen. That's silly. This goes back to the person who, who lost his key. A person who drops his key will often look next to a lamppost. But if you say to the man, why are you looking next to a lamppost? You dropped your key over there. The person will say, well, that's where the light is. There's no light over there. Therefore, I will look over here. We look at hydrogen frequencies because they are convenient. However, we don't think, scientists don't think that these aliens will communicate at hydrogen frequencies. Perhaps they use laser technology. We've only barely begun to scan other frequencies. Therefore, we have to look at the broadband. Also, when you communicate across vast distances, we sometimes take a signal and chop it up. And then we send each piece, and it reforms at the other end. That's how the internet works. Email is chopped up, sent through various cities, and is reformed at the other end. But if you were to intercept one fragment of email, you'd get nonsense, gibberish, until it's reformed. Therefore, in outer space, they probably send signals not on one frequency, but perhaps on the entire spectrum, so that a passing star will not interrupt the entire signal. Then at the other end, they reassemble the signal. If you were to listen in on their signal, you would hear gibberish, nonsense. In other words, we could be in the middle of an intergalactic conversation and we wouldn't even know. Our technology is so primitive, we look on simply one frequency. Any advanced civilization will send messages across all frequencies in order to compensate for passing stars, passing stellar explosion and static and interference. That's real science. However, scientists sometimes judge alien technology on the basis of what we can do, not on the basis of what a type 3 civilization, millions of years more advanced than ours, can do. There is the famous Fermi paradox. That is, if there are extraterrestrial beings out there, then where are they? Well, take a look at this. Let's say we have an anthill in the middle of a forest. And right next to the anthill, uh, they're building a 10-lane superhighway. And the question is, will the ants be able to communicate or understand what a 10-lane superhighway is? Will the ants be able to understand the technology, the intentions of beings building a 10-lane superhighway right next to the ants? Let's say, however, you go down to the ants. And you say to the ants, I bring you trinkets, I bring you beads, I bring you knowledge, I bring you nuclear energy, I bring you DNA technology, I bring you utopia, take me to your leader. Is that what you say when you bump into ants? No, most people simply step on a few of them. Now, if we are really a type zero civilization and beings of a type three civilization can soar across hyperspace, they are perhaps millions of years more advanced than us. The distance between us and ants would be the same comparable distance between type three and a type zero civilization. In other words, we are so arrogant, we're so conceited that we say they must visit us. We're so important that they're gonna interrupt all their business just to come to us and give us a little bit of super technology. I don't think so. Again, ants looking at a 10 lane superhighway, they would first of all not even know what a highway is, they would not be able to detect the presence of a highway, understand their communications, and even if they did, would the ants say, why don't they visit us? Why don't they come and bring us this fantastic technology of ours? I don't think so. Other than the question of perception, scientists point to physics-related problems to disprove the theory that we are being visited by extraterrestrials. Their main argument, of course, is the expansive distances that separate the stars, which seem at first glance uncrossable, even traveling close to the speed of light. 
in physics, we have something called the giggle factor. That is, anyone talking about UFOs will find themselves drummed out of the scientific community. UFO research is a third rail of science. Any scientist who dares touch UFO research finds their scientific career electrocuted. However, I think we have to look at the long-term perspective. Many scientists say the stars are so far away, hundreds, thousands of light years away, that any intelligent being would take thousands of years to reach the Earth, making it impractical. I think that's a mistake. Because we assume that these extraterrestrial beings are only 100, 200 years more advanced than us. Then that's a problem. Einstein said that the speed of light is the ultimate speed limit. You cannot go faster than the speed of light. That's Einstein's special theory of relativity. But you see, we have to go beyond Einstein. We have to go to the general theory of relativity, where it is possible, we think, that you might be able to go faster than the speed of light. And even beyond that, to the quantum theory, to the unified field theory, in which all bets are off. So I think that the fundamental mistake that many scientists make is that they assume that extraterrestrial beings are only 100, 200 years beyond our civilization, not thousands, millions of years beyond ours. What if extraterrestrials do not come from another planet, but rather from another dimension that we are unaware of, a sort of parallel universe out of our grasp? Five years ago, such a concept would have been considered ludicrous. However, with the discovery of quantum physics, our vision of the universe is changing. When I was a child, I used to go to the Japanese tea garden in San Francisco, and I used to look at the fish, the carp, swimming in a shallow pond. I used to go down and look at the fish and wonder what would it be like to live in two dimensions. These fish could only move forward, backward, left and right. And I imagined what a strange universe it must be. The concept of up, up into the third dimension was alien to them. I could put my nose right next to the fish, and they would never know that there was something called hyperspace. Today, many physicists believe that we are the fish. We move forward, backward, left, right, up, down. And we say that's all there is. What you see is what there is. However, we now believe that there is a theory of everything that will allow us to, quote, read the mind of God, as Albert Einstein would fondly say. We think that there is a higher theory called M-theory that exists in 11 dimension, dimensions where we have strings and membranes that pulsate. And we now believe that our universe is nothing but a tiny bubble a bubble floating in a much larger hyperspace. In other words, cosmologists don't really believe in a universe anymore. We believe in a multiverse, a megaverse of bubbles that are constantly springing into existence, expanding like in a Big Bang. So in other words, our universe may coexist in an ocean of other universes. Now, five, ten years ago, this notion was considered bizarre, science fiction, not anymore. In the last five years, the data is almost conclusive. We have something called inflation. The fact that the universe expanded in many stages, one an extremely rapid stage of expansion. The only way to explain this rapid expansion is to assume that our universe is a bubble, coexisting with other bubbles in a multiverse, in a megaverse of universes. Glad to be on. People uh, love physics, don't they? they? That's right. They're fascinated by the unknown, about worlds that we can't see, about whole universes that lie just beyond our comprehension. It's science fiction, and yet it's fact, which makes it all the more exciting. Let That's me, right. Go ahead. Well, the whole concept of other dimensions, black holes, being able to have wormholes take us to distant universes, holes in space, holes in time, that's a thing that really excites the imagination because now we're talking about physics and right. not science fiction. Yeah. Now, some science fiction doesn't do real justice to physics. Like most science fiction doesn't do real justice. One of the topics we wanted to talk about today is something called artificial intelligence. In fact, there was a big movie, of course, AI, Steven Spielberg's last uh, effort. Uh, not a great hit. And I gather not something you're a big fan of. Well, I think artificial intelligence will be coming, but I think it's going to take 50, perhaps maybe 100 years before humans wind up in a zoo and our, our robot creations throw peanuts at us behind bars <laughs> and make us dance like we do with zoo animals. We had Ray Kurzweil on last week, and of course, I'm sure you are familiar with his book, The Age of Spiritual Machines, in which he claims it is not far off before computers are as smart, in fact, smarter than human beings. Why is that such a difficult thing for, for you to imagine happening so soon? Well, I'm a physicist, and we are the ones who have to build these things. <laughs> and we realize that in 20 years, something called Moore's Law is going to collapse. Moore's Law says that the doubling time for computer power is, is about 18 months. Mm -hmm. That's why every Christmas, your Christmas toys are almost twice as powerful as they were the previous year. But that can't go on forever. It's held Eventually, up pretty well since 1975. That's right. However, by, in about 15 to 20 years, it will collapse, and Silicon Valley could become a rust belt. Uh -oh. We're talking about the end of the age of silicon, yeah. and perhaps the beginning of a new generation of computers called quantum computers, which is now exciting the world and igniting the imagination of physicists around the world. What are quantum computers? Well, quantum computers is the ultimate computer. It computes on atoms. And just last month, there was a scientific breakthrough that made headlines in the scientific world. Even the CIA took note of this. Mm -hmm. The most advanced quantum computer, now computing on seven atoms, proved that 3 times 5 is 15. 
Now, you may say to yourself, well, any kid knows that. Three times five is 15. But physicists were able to compute on seven atoms. Wow. Now, think about this. Once we can begin to compute on a few million atoms, we'll be able to break any code that the CIA can manufacture. The CIA is being very cautious about this new technology because it means that we will be able to break perhaps any code with a quantum computer. Again, within perhaps 20 to 30 years. Don't hold your breath. Now, the thing that's always puzzled me about quantum uh, computers is that the physical laws at that level are so very different. Things like uncertainty. Don't they, doesn't that come into play and, and make it difficult to make something that is stable? That's precisely why we will see the end of the age of silicon perhaps in 20 years. A Pentium chip, for example, has a layer that is about 20 atoms across. That's the thinnest layer in a Pentium chip. Mm -hmm. In about 15 to 20 years, the thinnest layer in a Pentium chip will be five atoms across. Five atoms. At that point, you don't really know where the electron is anymore. Right. The electron could be outside the wire, inside the wire. You have the uncertainty principle. Right. In other words, you get a short circuit. Therefore, silicon is unstable at the quantum level. You cannot sustain this Moore's law continually forever. And yet, course, and yet quantum computing operates at that level. What does it do that's different? You see, quantum computers consist totally of atoms that are arranged. They're spins like a spinning top right. or arranged in sequence. That's why it's so difficult to do anything more than about seven atoms. That's right. the largest we've been able to manufacture at the present time. You can shoot laser beams at them. You can shoot radio. And by looking at the reflection, the reflection of laser light and radio beams off these atoms, you've done a quantum calculation faster than any known computer. Wow. Now think about this. We can outrace any digital computer with a quantum computer once we start to get them off the ground. You think it's going to take that level of computing power to, to achieve artificial intelligence? It may. You know, if we take Moore's Law out to 50 years, yeah. which it, you can't do, right. but if you take it out to 50 years, we'll be computing at about 500 trillion bytes per second. That's the speed of human thought. Now again, we're talking about 50 years in the future, assuming that Moore's Law keeps on going, we will be able to approximate the speed of human thought. Right. But like I said before, that's a big if. We don't know whether quantum computers can even exist at that speed. Well, of course, you're talking about the building the machine that'll do this, and I've had big arguments with Ray Kurzweil, because I'm of the opinion that it's not mere speed that makes a human thought uh, what it is. It's a, it's a very difficult and ineffable thing that makes humans human. You think a machine can do it? Well, there are two basic problems with robots. Uh, first is vision, and the second is common sense. Right. Now, our most advanced computers and most advanced robots have the intelligence of a retarded cockroach. <laughs> A retarded cockroach, not Arnold Schwarzenegger in the movie Terminator, but a lobotomized, retarded cockroach is our most advanced computer. That's pathetic. On Mars, we have the Mars rover. Right. And, and a few years ago, the Mars rover had the distinction of being our most advanced robot on a distant world. It had the intelligence of a retarded cockroach. Right. It would take the Mars rover about an hour to walk across the room. An hour. Now, does that remind you of any of your relatives, <laughs> any of your friends? And how my aunt, but that's another story entirely. <laughs> <laughs> so we obviously have a long way to go. You talk about this stuff in visions, don't you? That's right. In my book, Visions, I, I project 20 to 50 to 100 years into the future. And again, 20 years in the future, we do have Moore's Law, which can reliably predict the power of computers before it collapses. However, 50 years is quite difficult. 50 years in the future, that's when robots could, in fact, become a little bit dangerous. Wow. They may begin to start to exceed the, the, the capability of the human brain in certain areas. And therefore, I suggest that far in the future, we put what is called an Asimov chip inside their brain. Once they start to get uppity, once they start to begin to have dreams about taking over, the chip will basically shut them off and will pull the plug on these computers. We're going to need Asimov's rules for robotics, I think. Micho, always right. great to talk to you. It's a great pleasure. And if you think 50 years is a long time, that means that's not that long. It means when our kids are our age or maybe a little bit older, it's not that far off. And it's an amazing that's right. World. In 20 years, we will see the end of Moore's Law, the collapse of Silicon Power. What a world. Micho, thank you so much. If you want to learn more about Micho, of course, mkaku.org, M-K-A-K-U dot O-R-G. Yes, I would second all these words. These are words of wisdom. However, there are some naysayers, naysayers who say that, well, there's a dangerous world out there. It's a dangerous world with rogue nations. Yes, there are rogue nations, principal among them, perhaps, the United States of America. It's a dangerous world, they say. In other words, we have to have peace through strength. That's what they say. Well, I say we have to have strength through peace. Now, strength through peace, what does that mean? That means that in the 21st century, you are strong if you have a vibrant economy, if you have much discussions of civil liberties and human rights, if you have vigorous civic life and democratic discussions and a vibrant economy. That is true strength. And it's not strength through war, it is strength that comes through peace. However, there are some naysayers. First of all, they say it's not possible. Human nature, they say, will not tolerate this. Well, look at the situation in Japan. There's some people here from Japan. And in Japan, there is a culture of peace. Mm -hmm. In the United States, in order to get elected, you have to show how tough you are. 
You have to show what a, what a great key man you are to get elected <laughs> to the United States. In Japan, sometimes it's the opposite. In Japan, the center of gravity, the center of gravity is for peace. You have to show you're for peace in order to get elected in many times in Japan. There's a different culture there. So it's not human nature. We have examples. We have examples of nations that don't have a culture of war, that have, in turn, a culture of peace. And so why is it, therefore, why is it, therefore, that the American people vote for a president with a tremendous military budget? Well, the number one issue in the country right now is Social Security. And the one question that everyone's asking right now is, <laughs> there's no money. There's no money. What about health care? There's no money. There's no money. Well, what I'm telling you now is there's plenty of money. It happens to go to the Pentagon. We have a huge Pentagon budget. But then people say peace through strength. In other words, we have to, the politicians, have to not only take credit for the past, but they also have to show how menacing the future is. My point of view is the politicians will fight progressive change with every tooth and fiber in their body until they realize that it's inevitable, then they take credit for it. <laughs> so therefore, what is it about the politicians that make good, well-meaning Americans, peaceful, loving Americans, vote for a huge Pentagon budget in spite of all the rhetoric that there's no money for health care, there's no money for Social Security? Well, I think you know the reason. The politicians tend to play with the truth a little bit. And in fact, I have, as a physicist, I have a foolproof test. I tested it out last night on the evening news to tell when President Bush is lying. It works every time. As a president, I know that, as a physicist, I know the test is, if his lips move, you know he's lying. <laughs> so if you look at public opinion then, so what is it about public opinion? What about the American people? Do they like war or do they like peace? Several years ago, I wrote a book called To Win a Nuclear War, and I had the chance to go through the archives, the archives of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. They are some of the most secret documents in the post-war era. I had a chance to go through our war plans, the minutes of the meetings. And during the Korean War, it was quite interesting. During the Korean War, we know that President Eisenhower had plans to drop the atomic bomb on North Korea. It was called Oplan 852. I even have a copy of the atomic annex of Oplan 852. And in Oplan 852 in the atomic annex, we have targets to be vaporized with the use of nuclear weapons. We have minutes of one meeting where Eisenhower goes to the map. He goes to the map and selectively selects targets where nuclear weapons will be used. But then there's a debate a debate in his cabinet, a debate with the National Security Council. There are voices, the Secretary of State, John Foster Dulles, being the primary one, saying that we have to use nuclear weapons. And then other people say, the American people are not ready. So Eisenhower decides to go to the press, and he decides to test the waters. And he makes his famous bombs are bullets speech. It's in the history books. President Eisenhower says that we have to get used to the idea that atomic bombs are like bullets. We use bullets all the time. And it's about time we got used to the idea that atomic bombs are no different than bullets. Well, the next day, I have the minutes of the meeting. The next day, there was a flood of telegrams coming into the White House saying, are you crazy? Have you gone out of your mind? Adlai Stevenson, we have his telegram saying, you've lost it. Atomic bombs are like bullets. And then I also have the minutes of the meeting that took place after that. Eisenhower comes out and says, you cannot, he says, as a former general, I know you cannot fight a war when half your people want peace. You cannot fight a war holding up all these telegrams where the American people will not tolerate the use of nuclear weapons. What's the lesson here? The lesson here is that the will of the people, the will of the people, even the politicians, even the politicians have to listen to that. And that's why we're here today. That's why we have to mobilize. That's why we have to keep the spirit of Upton Sinclair alive and well. And just remember that we have minor victories all the time. Last month, the Navajo people voted to ban all uranium mining on one of the largest uranium reservations in the continental United States. They voted. I should also point out that the Brookhaven National Laboratory had a document issued years ago stating that certain areas, Native American lands, should be declared a national sacrifice area to preserve the nuclear fuel cycle. Think about that. Native American lands declared a national sacrifice area. I think we should declare the Pentagon a national <laughs> sacrifice area. And then the military has another document. It should be required reading. It's called Vision for 2020. It's on the web. Maybe you've seen it already. I paraphrase the vision for 2020 of the U.S. Space Command. The head of the U.S. Space Command is now chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. In it, it summarizes the last 2,000 years of world history. Why did Rome, why did Rome dominate the world? Because its engineers controlled good roads. 
Good roads meant good logistics by which you can fight wars with tremendous logistical rapidity and flexibility. The Romans had good engineers. They controlled the land. And then why did the great powers, the great powers of the 1800s, how come they ruled the world? How come the sun never set on the British Empire? Because they controlled the oceans. They had gunboat diplomacy. They controlled the oceans, ruled Britannia. Britannia rules the waves. And then the future belongs to the nation that controls the next frontier, space. So now you know why there's no money. There's plenty of money. It's all going up in a Star Wars program that don't work. In other words, the military is planning for new Rome. That's the catchword among conservatives these days. Talk to any conservative, and they'll talk gleefully about, old, about new Rome. My attitude is, what happened to old Rome? <laughs> it fell. And why did it fall? Because of imperial overreach. President Kennedy, uh, Professor Kennedy at Yale wrote a book about this and analyze the fall of the Roman Empire, the British Empire, the Spanish Empire, the Dutch Empire. Why did all these empires rise and fall? Empires, he said, rise and fall in three stages. The first stage, stage one, is when you have a vibrant economy. Rome at the juncture of two great rivers. London with its access to the British Channel. A vibrant economy is stage one. Stage two, the empire is not just content to trade with markets, they want to control them militarily. Rome declares war on Carthage. Rome becomes an empire and starts to take over his neighboring land. That's stage two. Then there's stage three. Stage three is imperial overreach. The military is spread so thin, so widely, that it corrupts the economy. It corrupts the spirit of the people. The people begin to bicker. The economy begins to fluctuate and eventually starts to decline. The goose that lay the golden egg, the economy, starts to get devoured by the war machine. And let me ask you a question. What stage are we in? Think about that. And let me end on one last note. Like I said before, there are small victories everywhere we go. The Navajo people have stood up. You also heard that a few months ago, the Canadian people mm -hmm. decided to pull out of the Star Wars program. Mm -hmm. They saw a system that don't work. They realized that a ton of money is going to be wasted. They decided to pull out of the Star Wars program, even though the Canadian government has publicly voiced support for the Star Wars program. They put their ear to the ground, and the Canadian people said, no Star Wars. And that means less money, less initiative for the Star Wars program. And then let me just end on one last note. Of course, we do want a peace department that will hopefully study history the way it should be studied. According to Seymour Hersh of the New York Times, we know that President Nixon had a secret plan to end the war in Vietnam. That's, right. That's why he got elected. That's right. According to Seymour Hersh, we know what that plan was. Mm -hmm. It was called Operation Duck Hook, the plan to drop two atomic bombs on North Korea in November of 1969. Operation Duck Hook was in two volumes, a blue cover for volume one and volume two, with a jet aircraft taking off uh, the, sur the surface of an aircraft carrier. Volume 2 had the atomic annex. In Volume 2, the appendix had the photographs of the sites where the two atomic bombs would be dropped near the border between North Korea and China. Many people have seen Operation Duck Hook and have since commented to the press about Nixon's secret plan to end the war in Vietnam in November of 1969. So why didn't he drop the bomb? Because in October of 69, two weeks before the November ultimatum, there were a quarter of a million people right. marching in the streets of Washington, D.C., saying, peace now, That's give right. peace a chance. And two weeks later, there was a second demonstration, sandwiching, right. sandwiching the November ultimatum, another quarter of a million people. And according to Nixon's memoirs, he doesn't mention the atomic annex, but he says, quote, I could not execute right. the November ultimatum because he feared that these people would not be content to march outside the White House lawn. Right. They'd march inside the White House lawn instead. The point I'm raising is something very simple, and that is there's one power more powerful than a hydrogen bomb. There's one thing more powerful than all our nuclear weapons, and that is the will of the people. And if we can tap into the will of people, then we too could have a culture of peace, we too could have a peace department, and we too could then make sure that our swords are turned into plowshares. Thank you. I must disagree with my esteemed <laughs> colleague there. Okay. First of all, part. let me say that science is the engine of prosperity. From steam power, to electricity, to the laser, to the transistor, <coughs> to the computer. That's not true. We're That's talking about, hey, hey, can I have my, my <laughs> Sure. You had your say, let yes. me have my say. Yes. However, the information revolution has a weakness, and the weakness is precisely the educational system. The United States has the worst educational system known to science. Our graduates compete regularly at the level of third world countries. So how come the scientific establishment of the United States doesn't collapse? If we're producing uh, a generation of dummies, if the stupid index of America keeps rising every year, just watch network television and reality shows, right? 
How come the scientific establishment of the United States doesn't collapse? Let me tell you something. Some of you may not know this. America has a secret weapon. That secret weapon is the H-1B. Without the H-1B, the scientific establishment of this country would collapse. Forget about Google. Forget about Silicon Valley. There would be no Silicon Valley without, without the H-1B. And you know what the H-1B is? It's the genius visa, okay? You realize that in the United States, 50% of all PhD candidates are foreign-born. At my system, one of the biggest in the United States, 100% of the PhD candidates are foreign-born. The United States is a magnet sucking up all the brains of the world, but now the brains are going back. Right. They're going back to China. They're going back to India. And people are saying, oh my God, there's a Silicon Valley in India now. Oh my God, there's a Silicon Valley in China. Duh. Where did it come from? It came from the United States. So don't tell me that science isn't the engine of prosperity. You remove the H-1B visa and you collapse the economy. Then Wall Street Journal editorialized against a congressman who wanted to ban the H-1B, saying they'll take jobs away from the American people. The Wall Street Journal said, look, there are no Americans who can take these jobs. These are at the highest level of high technology. They don't take away jobs from Americans. They create entire industries. And so that's why we have an Achilles heel, and that's the educational system. The and again, I sociology I majors are not necessarily going to be the ones determining the future of Silicon Valley. The but physicists, okay. the engineers, is, the we need more of them, not less. The irony is, the irony is... The irony is, I, I agree with the immigration issues that what you're saying. Uh, and I'm at a school, of course, and Peter's a graduate of a school where, where indeed, your school wouldn't exist without the H1B. Of course, of course. But, I, but I'm not. got to get back to the future of business. But, but hold on a second. I'm not. No, 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 no. I'm not arguing against an, H, an H1B. I, I completely agree with this issue. And the, and the point on the future of business that he's making, which is very, very important, is the nature of human capital. What is misunderstood here is, again, how poorly run schools are. MIT is a notable exception in this regard. His school, his school, his school is not. Because what happens is they, they run in these introductory science and engineering classes at Illinois and Wisconsin and Michigan. They run freshman and sophomore years as flunk out operations. They, 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 do it to, they, they run it as a boot camp. And then people are surprised that people don't take science, that they don't take the STEM courses. The point that I'm trying to make, which, is, which I think is, is an important one in this regard, is that the way educational systems are set up right now is that we have distorted incentives that undermine the ability for America to have a homegrown uh, science and technology. We will still have wars. People have self-interest. They have strategic interest, domestic resource interest, and so what have you. However, the question is, whose interests are we talking about? The interests of the king or queen? They don't care about public opinion. They don't take polls. They just go and wage wars. Now, with a democracy, it's much more difficult. You have this raging debate in the newspapers. You see mothers coming on TV crying about their child that died in the last war. To go to war for a democracy takes a lot of work. But that all is a good thing. Because once a democracy decides to go to war, it's full blast. But you have the will of the people behind it. Now, uh, let me ask you one more question about uh, democracy and technology. And I think the, the two have actually something in common in the sense that they create this artificial sense of agency. And take my iPad, for example. Like, I, it gives me the impression of control. I, I think I can use whatever I want with it. But the problem is, of course, that you know, I cannot change the operating system. I can only download the applications that have already been created for me. And I think a democracy is a bit similar in that regard, that people believe that they have all the controls at their disposal, but some of those controls seem to be artificial. So uh, I guess what I'm saying is that this, uh, both democracy and technology can numb your sense of agency. Let me ask you a question. Name a better system that has withstood the, 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 the long period of time that has given people prosperity, given people peace. Give me the name of another system Mr. that Chicago, is better. I'm not arguing against democracy. I'm arguing against the appearance of democracy, which I think exists in There's many no of the Western There's no such thing countries. as a perfect democracy. The Greeks did not have a perfect democracy. They had slaves, for God's sake, when democracy was first created. Well, I think it's a, it's a very American argument, but uh, for me, I think people... it's not American. It is the argument. Well, I, I don't want to get into an argument with you, but I, I think it is problematic for many people. But that's what democracy is all about. Democracy is about sharpening two points of view and let the best argument win, rather than saying, I'm the king, off with your head. But OK, let me sharpen my point. Uh, George W. Bush was a democratically elected president. Obviously, as you said, he had some consultations about that war, but that war was launched under a false... I must disagree with my esteemed <laughs> colleague here. Okay. Except First of all, let me say that <laughs> science is the engine of prosperity. From steam power, to electricity, to the laser, to the transistor, <coughs> to the computer. That's not true. We're That's talking about, hey, mate, hey, can I have my, my <laughs> say? Sure. You had your say. Let yes. me have my say. Yes. However, the information revolution has a weakness, and the weakness is precisely the educational system. The United States has the worst educational system known to science. Our graduates compete regularly at the level of third world countries. So how come the scientific establishment of the United States doesn't collapse? If we're producing uh, a generation of dummies, if the stupid index of America keeps rising every year, just watch network television and reality shows, right? 
How come the scientific establishment of the United States doesn't collapse? Let me tell you something. Some of you may not know this. America has a secret weapon. That secret weapon is the H-1B. Without the H-1B, the scientific establishment of this country would collapse. Forget about Google. Forget about Silicon Valley. There would be no Silicon Valley without, without the H-1B. And you know what the H-1B is? It's the genius visa, okay? You realize that in the United States, 50% of all PhD candidates are foreign-born. At my system, one of the biggest in the United States, 100% of the PhD candidates are foreign-born. The United States is a magnet sucking up all the brains of the world, but now the brains are going back. Right. They're going back to China. They're going back to India. And people are saying, oh my God, there's a Silicon Valley in India now. Oh my God, there's a Silicon Valley in China. Duh. Where did it come from? It came from the United States. So don't tell me that science isn't the engine of prosperity. You remove the H-1B visa and you collapse the economy. In Wall Street Journal, editorialized against a congressman who wanted to ban the H-1B, saying they'll take jobs away from the American people. The Wall Street Journal said, look, there are no Americans who can take these jobs. These are at the highest level of high technology. They don't take away jobs from Americans. They create entire industries. We, and so that's why we have an Achilles heel, and that's the educational system. The, and again, the, sorry, sociology the majors are not necessarily going to be the ones determining the future of Silicon Valley. The, but physicists, okay. the engineers, is, the, we need more of them, not less. The irony is, the irony is... The irony is, I, I agree with the immigration issues, that what you're saying. Uh, and I'm at a school, of course, and Peter's a graduate of a school where, where indeed, your school wouldn't exist without the H-1B. Of course, of course. But, I, but I'm We've not. We've got to get back to the future I'm not, of business. But, but hold on a second. Step. I'm not. No, 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 no. I'm not arguing against an, H, an H-1B. I, I completely agree with this issue. And the point on the future of business that he's making, which is very, very important, is the nature of human capital. What is misunderstood here is again how poorly run schools are. MIT is a notable exception in this regard. His school, his school, his school is not. Because what happens is they, they run in these introductory science and engineering classes at Illinois and Wisconsin and Michigan. They run freshman and sophomore years as flunk out operations. They, 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 do it to, they, they run it as a boot camp. And then people are surprised that people don't take science, that they don't take the STEM courses. The point that I'm trying to make, which, is, which I think is, is an important one in this regard, is that the way educational systems are set up right now is that we have distorted incentives that undermine the ability for America to have a homegrown uh, science and technology. We will still have wars. People have self-interest. They have strategic interest, domestic resource interest, and so what have you. However, the question is, whose interests are we talking about? The interests of the king or queen? They don't care about public opinion. They don't take polls. They just go and wage wars. Now, with a democracy, it's much more difficult. You have this raging debate in the newspapers. You see mothers coming on TV crying about their child that died in the last war. To go to war for a democracy takes a lot of work. But that all is a good thing. Because once a democracy decides to go to war, it's full blast. But you have the will of the people behind it. Now, uh, let me ask you one more question about uh, democracy and technology. And I think they, they two have actually something in common in the sense that they create this artificial sense of agency. And take my iPad, for example. Like, I, it gives me the impression of control. I, I think I can use whatever I want with it. But the problem is, of course, that, you know, I cannot change the operating system. I can only download the applications that have already been created for me. And I think a democracy is a bit similar in that regard, that people believe that they have all the controls at their disposal, but some of those controls seem to be artificial. So uh, I guess what I'm saying is that this, uh, both democracy and technology can numb your sense of agency. Let me ask you a question. Name a better system that has withstood the, 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 the long period of time that has given people prosperity, given people peace. Give me the name of another system Mr. that Chicago, is better. I'm not arguing against democracy. I'm arguing against the appearance of democracy, which I think exists in There's many no of the Western There's no such thing countries. as a perfect democracy. The Greeks did not have a perfect democracy. They had slaves, for God's sake, when democracy was first created. Well, I think it's a, it's a very American argument, but uh, for me, people... I think people... it's not American. It is the argument. Well, I, I don't want to get into an argument with you, but I, I think it is problematic for many people. But that's what democracy is all about. Democracy is about sharpening two points of view and let the best argument win, rather than saying, I'm the king, off with your head. But OK, let me sharpen my point. Uh, George W. Bush was a democratically elected president. Obviously, as you said, he had some consultations about that war, but that war was launched under a false pretext. The democratic procedure that exists there in the United States, consultations with the Congress, because the Congress wasn't consulted back then. So the, the democratic procedure wasn't really explored. I think what people you're didn't saying to actually First deliver of all, the very judgment. fact that you can actually say these things is a testament to the fact that the world has come a long ways from the days of the czars and the kings and the queens. You'd be put in prison for saying a fraction of the things that you just said. But I wonder why, why is it that freedom of speech is considered to be the domain of Western democracies? Freedom of, of speech, freedom of science, freedom of exploration existed in a non-democratic world not as well. Exist. Name me a country. Name me a country throughout history, human history, that had freedom of speech, freedom of science, freedom of religion. Name me that country. To a limited extent, you can't. a lot of them. You can't China, because there is Russia. none. Well, freedom, oh, yeah. freedom of I science. I don't think so. If you, if you disobey the emperor, off with your head.
again, challenging the democratic system could be also